Good morning, New City. Welcome, welcome to church this morning. We are so happy you're here. If you are new with us today, we welcome you. You are our special guest today, both here and online. We're so happy you're here. Let's get our hearts ready for worship. Um, let's reflect on the goodness and the faithfulness of God this morning. We love you. Thank you, New City.
Verse 6 says, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord, right? And then it goes again to say, praise the Lord. So when I see that there's like a double stanza or double sentence like that with the same phrase, that means that it means something. So I want us to praise the Lord. Again, I say, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So can we sing this part together? There's a part in this song that says, let everything that has breath da, da, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, we say, let everything that is bread, that is bread, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I think we got it. Hey. <laughs> I think we got it. Y'all gonna sing it with us? You gonna sing it with us? Hey, come on. Let's try it right here. Come on, cut your hands right here, right here. Come on. Can we move a little bit? Come on, come on. We say, let everything. Praise cause you reign, praise cause you rose and defeated the 
Of the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. We draw nigh to you, Father, today. We draw closer in worship to you today, Father. In the name of Jesus, Lord. We open our hearts, Father, to receive what it is that you want to do in this moment and throughout this service, Father. We ask for you to endow us with your glory, Jesus. Can we lift our hands all over this room? Just want to be with you. We draw nigh to you, Jesus. We draw nigh to you. We draw.
can just have our seats in the presence of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Sunday, New City. I'm Devin. And I'm Hope. And we're here to say welcome to church. It is so important to us that everyone who walks through our doors on a Sunday or tunes into our live stream feels at home. So if you're new to all of this, come see our team at the Connect Corner after service. We would really love to get to know you and answer any questions you might have about New City. And those of you who are joining us online can text CONNECT to the number at the bottom of the screen, 312-313-2729. Our team wants to reach out to welcome you and share more about all the ways you can connect with the life and community of New City. Guys of New City, meet me at the New City HQ on Saturday, August 26th at 7 a.m. for our next men's crew breakfast. Crew is a place for you to strengthen your relationship with God and others. And these breakfasts are always a refreshing time of encouragement and fellowship. You can look forward to bottomless coffee, Chick-fil-A breakfast, and a powerful story from someone like you. To find out more, go to the Connect Corner or visit newcity.life. Our fall discipleship season will officially be launching on September 17th, and we are still in the process of filling out our roster of small group leaders. Leading a small group is an eight-week commitment that will bless you, not just the people in your group. If you have any interest in how you can host a group, take out your phone right now and scan the QR code. Feel free to also stop by the Connect Corner after service for more information. We want to answer all your questions and give you all the resources to set your group up to win this season. It has been an incredibly fruitful summer of discipleship at New City U. Every Wednesday night, we had students hungry for God's word coming together to learn how to pray, read the Bible, and worship alongside their peers. Uh, hello, I'm Nathan Peake. I'm 16 and I go to Downers Grove South High School. My name is Ishmael. I go to Obarzi Valley High School and I'll be entering my sophomore year. My name is Brianna Hicks, I'm Giselle's mom, and New City Church is my home. Something I love about New City is the atmosphere that it creates and the people that it allows me to meet. Like, everyone together just creates a super cool atmosphere and super like fun environment to be in. One thing I learned about God is that it's always good to have faith in Him. He's always that person that you'll be able to depend upon. So I'm glad that this summer, I learned about that and I was able to take advantage of it. One of my goals for this year was to make sure my daughter was a part of youth night and making sure that she knew who God was and the love of Jesus and make sure she had that in her soul when she transitioned into middle school. So that was very important to me. And I made sure that she was here every Wednesday night and I saw a difference just within the last few months. I wanted to know more about the Bible this summer because the Bible isn't just like any other book. It's a book that has meaning and purpose behind it. So I just want to learn more about the purpose of the Word and what it has to offer and what I can learn from it. Discipleship training looked for me like everybody got in a group, sat down, all have our binders, and we speak about maybe like a certain verse in the Bible and we'll all come together and like, what does this part mean? So we can all have a whole like understanding about it so we're on the same page. You know, we're trying to decipher this, trying to decipher that. And at the end, we'll all sum it up and what it means, how this can help us maybe in the future, what this means, maybe what they, we were confused about in our past. Just helps a lot when you're trying to understand more and more about the Bible and how it works along with God. Uh, this school year, I want to see God kind of just use me as someone that people can come to when they like need help and someone that doesn't kind of fall into the trends and stereotypes of like high school and what it has, but someone that like, kind of stands out and can be someone to be a helping hand for others.
When you give to New City, you are making a critical investment in the next generation through New City Youth. Today, you can give in one of three ways. On our app, on the New City website, or by texting a dollar amount to the number 84321. Thank you for your faithful support, and we pray God blesses you as you give. We are so excited to have Pastor Steve back in the house today continuing our current sermon series, New Ground. Have an amazing Sunday, New City. We love you. Give it up for what God is doing and what a great group of young people. And uh, we want to say thank you to you for being a part of service today. Uh, it's always so great to have everybody in the house. And for those who are online, we want to welcome you too. And I, I want to keep, keep remembering we've got uh, folks from a dozen or so um, retirement communities, uh, senior living communities who are tuning in every week as they're kind of in the main area as their church service. So let's give it up for all those who might be online watching us from another place. We want to welcome them to be into this whole moment. Um, well, I, I'm, I told you last week that we were gonna, I was going to spend the week not reading the news. And uh, because so that, was my, that was my scroll, that was my scroll, right? Uh, not the social media thing. I, I, I hope there were a few of you, few of you who kind of decided to take the week off of social media. Um, I don't know if it, it was you. If, I don't know if you were able. But I could tell, I could see it on your face if you're glowing today that you were not on social media this week because... I'm going to get you on board with this uh, eventually. We're all going to get off of it. Um, yeah, Meta's going to go out of business. Uh, we'll see about that. But um, it has been, I realized this morning, I made a joke last week, said, you know, when I come in this uh, next week, I'm going to be so ready to worship. I really was ready to worship today because you know what? Instead of reading the news, I was reading the Bible, and I was reading some other stuff. It wasn't like I didn't read it before, but I, I was reading, I just, it just was a different meditation this week uh, for that extra time that I have because I'm a reader and I just will find something to read. Um, and so I want to encourage you going on. We're going we're gonna to continue just down the path that we've been on with this series that we're calling New Ground from the book of Joshua. But I, I just wanted to report back. It was a great week. Um, somebody said to me in the middle of the week, they said, well, you know, you, you've heard about what's happening in Maui. And I said, what? And, uh, and I, it dawned on me a little while later, I, I don't know anything that's going on anywhere. Um, you know, I felt a little bit out of, out of uh, you know, disoriented by it all. We are praying for the wildfires that, and the people who are affected by those wildfires in Maui. Um, but it was it was a it was an interesting experience to say you know what I, I, you know my first attention was not to my first intention upon learning about that was not to just go and uh, and read about it, but to pray about it, and and so we're going to believe for God to to be present. Convoy of Hope, one of our partners, is present there right now, helping along with many other organizations who are going to be assisting those who are in need. So let's stand together as we get ready to read our text. Um, We're wrapping up the, the uh, summertime, and for many uh, children and young people, we are starting school in the next week or two. And I should say teachers and educators who may already be back in the office and doing other things. But this is a great moment to pray for them as well and to believe for God to uh, just be present and to bless this coming school year. Uh, first, I'm going to read our text from Joshua chapter 5. It says this, Now when Joshua was near Jericho... He looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And then Joshua f fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went in, no one went out, and no one came in. And then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. And on the seventh day, march around the city seven times. 
with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout, and then the wall of the city will collapse, and the army will go up, everyone straight in. It's a wild plan. <laughs> Never before or since, I, I can imagine, has there been any military strategist who's come up with that one. But we're going to ask for God's wisdom today as we consider this text. Lord, I pray that you would... Help us in our hearts to receive your word. Thank you, God, that your word is life. Thank you that you are interested in speaking. Thank you for this time of worship that we've had together, for your presence that's already here with us. And God, we do pray blessing on those who are getting ready to go back to school today, uh, this coming week and then the weeks to come, those educators, those administrators, students and children who are going to be uh, back in the classroom. God, we pray for this year to be blessed and favored, to be protected. Lord, we pray every one of these children of ours, Lord, we pray your protection over them and that their hearts and minds would not just be formed to learn facts and to learn, and to learn all, the, all, the, all the things that they need to learn, but their characters would be formed to be like that of Jesus. God, we accept the responsibility to be a part of that process. We pray, Lord, for those in Maui today, God, who are without homes, those who maybe even have lost loved ones through this tragedy, God. We pray that you would speed help and aid to their side, Lord, that you would, uh, Lord, resolve all this. And, God, that you would be exalted somehow in the midst of this, Lord, bringing comfort and bringing compassion to those who are in need. We pray a special strength for those who are there to serve and to help those who are in need and ask, God, that you would be with them. Now, God, make your word uh, like that two-edged sword that, that, that it says that it is, that it, is, that it would cut to divide joint, uh, soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and, God, that it would judge the thoughts and attitudes of our hearts. We pray this, and we believe, God, for you to do it in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. You can be seated. Now, let me real quick just, just help us. This is a, uh, I, I don't want to say it's a necessarily a challenging text. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the marching around the city. We're just going to start the march today. Just kidding. Some of you guys, anybody come from a church where you did a Jericho march? No. Um, that'd, be, that'd be great if we all just started, if I said, hey, guys, let's stand up. We're marching. You guys would be like, what is going on in here? Um, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about that. I want to talk about this encounter that Joshua has with the commander of the army of the Lord. Because in the text, he's there and he's kind of scouting Jericho out. This is a city, the very first major city that the people of Israel are encountering now that they have crossed the Jordan River into the land, into their ancestral lands. Now you can imagine, uh, for those of you who know the story, that these were the ancestral lands that were promised to Abraham and his descendants. But because of famine in that place, they left and went down to Egypt where at first things were going great. <laughs> and then there was a change in leadership in Egypt, and the Bible says there was some, there was the, the, the leadership there was threatened by the people, by that family of, of Israel. And, and eventually they were enslaved for not just a generation or two, but for over 400 years. So in that time, all these other people have come to occupy the lands that were promised to Abraham's family. And now God has finally had this moment where he says, now we're going to go back to the land and I'm going to give the land to you as I promised many generations before. Now, Joshua is scouting out this major city, Jericho, whose walls are basically impregnable. There's no way that anybody can, uh, you know, that, that particularly uh, a group of people like the Israelites who've literally just been wandering through the desert for 40 years are going to be able to do this. And you know that he's looking at the city going, how in the world are we going to do this? 40 years earlier, he had been in a similar situation. He and 11 others had been sent by Moses to go and to scout out the people of the land. And there, you can imagine, he had, he had, he's having like kind of like this full circle moment where now, 40 years later, he's looking at the same situation, wondering in some ways, but here's the, the, here's the thing. Joshua, 40 years early, earlier, had known God would help them to take the city. He has the same attitude today. He's a much older Joshua standing there, but knowing that there is no technological or military might that is going to help them to breach the walls of this great city. No, I would say there's no natural hope of getting through. So somehow we have to admit that the plan is to, for Joshua is just to throw themselves on the walls and trust God is going to help them with the battle. 
But then as he's scouting out the city, the Bible says that he looks up and sees a man with a sword drawn right there near to him. Now, I want you to see this. This is, this is a drawn sword in those days is a provocation, right? Uh, I, I've heard people say, don't, don't, you know, to law enforcement, that don't unholster your gun unless you think you're going to need to use it, <laughs> right? This is the same idea. You don't, you don't just go walking around with a gun unholstered, right? Whether you're a soldier or whether it's just not the thing. And so, and so it's the same situation here. He sees a man standing there with his sword drawn, and Joshua knows this is, this is, this is a situation. And so he does what anybody who is in his situation would do. He, he confronts the man, and he says, are you for us or are you for them? Now, in the Hebrew, it's really interesting in, your, in the translation that I read, it says this. It says neither. But in the Hebrew, it actually just says no. <laughs> and it gets at the heart of what the man there with the drawn sword is actually saying. It's not that I'm neither for you or for them. It's, it's no, you're asking the wrong question. <laughs> it's not whether I'm for you or I'm for them. It's whether are you on my side that is the right question. Are you on my side? And so in, in some way, at this point, Joshua falls down to worship. And I want to give you this little bit of insight. He falls down to worship. And the fascinating thing about this character who we don't know very much about is that this particular man, the angel of the Lord in this situation, actually receives the worship that Joshua is giving. Now, you can think of other instances in the Bible where people try and worship angels. I think of particularly in, John, in uh, Revelation 22 where John, the apostle, falls down at the face, falls down on his face in front of the, the angel that has just shown him this incredible revelation. And the angel says, no, don't do it. I'm a creature just like you. <laughs> he says, don't, don't make that mistake, John. Even though this angel is a, gr is, is a great, uh, you know, like kind of I in imposing being, even though there was something marvelous and beautiful about the, the angel says, do not make that mistake. But here, the angel of the Lord in this instance receives the worship from Joshua. Now, there is this character in the Old Testament that I want you to be, I kind of want you to be interested, uh, I want you to be introduced to. There is this character in the Old Testament that keeps showing up at different moments and is referred to most often as the angel of the Lord. Not an angel of the Lord, but the angel of the Lord. And it's this, commentators see it in these numerous moments in the Old Testament where we get a glimpse of what they would, what they would say is, um, they might refer to him as the pre-incarnate Christ. This moment where the presence of God is inhabiting human form so that sinful man, out of, out of mercy from God, can have this interaction with him. And so you see it in Abraham. You see it with Abraham. You see it with Hagar. You see it with Moses, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know that story of the man in the, in the flames who appeared as to be the son of man. And so you see, you see these moments where we see these appearances happening in these moments of deliverance. Where God says, in order to deliver my people, I'm going to have to take on this form. The pre-incarnate Christ. Now, I, I know that seems like, you know, it's God showing up to intervene. And the angel of the Lord is telling, is telling Joshua, listen, stop asking me the question whether I'm on your side or I'm on their side. You worry about whether you're on my side. And then he says this. And it's very often the case like this. Where he says, take off your shoes. The ground you're standing on is holy. That's another indication that we're not just talking about any angelic being here. The ground that you're standing on is holy. And as is often the case, when God has to point to one thing that he wants to define himself by, whether it was Moses with the burning bush, which, which was also called the angel of the Lord by Jewish commentators, Moses with the burning bush, or now Joshua with the angel of the Lord, God says, what I want you to know first about me is that I am holy. I, it's the first thing you need to know is that I'm holy. It's interesting because we don't go down that path very much, do we? 
But here's my first point from our text today, and this is what I want to talk about, God's holiness as we see in this text. First of all, God's holiness is good news. Now, what do I mean by that? God's holiness is good news. Well, what I mean is that many times you and I actually aren't looking at God's holiness as great news for us. That's why we don't celebrate it very much. That's why we don't sing. If I were to take, uh, you know, kind of like a look at all the worship songs that are in circulation today, everything that's playing on the Christian radio stations and being sung in church, I would find a lot of songs about God's love, about God's mercy. I would find a lot of songs about how God makes me feel or even about what God has done for me. But not many songs are in rotation that celebrate the holiness of God. Because when it comes down to it as a worship leader for, for decades, I can, I can tell you what my experience has been. When I sing, when I lead a song about the love of God, people are like, yes, thank you, God. When I lead a song about the, the forgiveness of God, people say, oh, thank you for your forgiveness. When I lead a song about the holiness of God, they go, what? But it's the first thing that God leads with. Know that I'm holy, he says. So you and I, you know, we, we need to figure this out. We need to figure out why does God want us to know this first about himself. Jonathan Edwards, philosopher, pastor, um, said, said in, in his book called Religious Affections that it's possible to be attracted to God because of his love. And it's possible to be attracted to God for his forgiveness or for his provision. All these things might draw us in to, to want to know God better and to really begin to, to lean into and to love God better. But he says, hey, let's just be honest. These are all some form of selfish attraction. Right? What can you do for me, God? They benefit me. And, and, and Edward says this, when someone, and this is his whole point of the book, is to say, how do I know when I'm, really, when I'm really stepping into and living out the saving grace of God in my life? He says this, when someone begins to delight in God's holiness, I'm paraphrasing, they're hitting pay dirt in their relationship with God. They're getting down to bedrock. Because holiness is the difference between God's usefulness to me and his beauty for who he is. Now you say, well, what is holiness? And I, I would say the, the problem with this word holy is that it's kind of a broken word in our culture. We say, man, I, are you going to invite him? He, I just, I've, I've been around him and he's got like this holier than thou sort of attitude. Right? Nobody, nobody wants to be around the, the person who's holier than thou. We, when we think of holy, we think of morally rigid, right? We, we think of proud or judgmental. And so we can see this word holy is broken in our understanding and it needs to get fixed because God says, this is what I need you to know about me. And what I'm saying is holiness about God is the good news. Holiness means there is no one else like God. I've, I've reflected on this random comment I made like a couple months ago where I was talking about churches are filled with older people. We old people, we love to go to church. And young people, eh, you know, maybe. Let's see what's going on there. How's the music? Are there are the people cute? You know, are there other people? You know, is there something? Eh, old people find themselves in church because we've been around the sun long enough to see just about everybody we know fail us. <laughs> we, we've seen kind of the ebb and flow of culture and circumstance and history, and we've been able to see now and, and look and say, you know what? Uh, you know, people are going, uh, the people are broken and faulty. And so when I start talking about the holiness of God, I think, I think if you've seen other people who are broken, and then I tell you, but God is perfect in all his ways, that ought to excite you a little bit, because at least there's one person that you can know that will never fail you. No one else is like God. He's absolutely perfect. He is just. He is fair. He is right. He is good. He is pure. Revelation 15.4 says, you alone, O God, are holy. Psalm 18.30 says, as for God, all his ways are perfect and holy. That's what holy means. I ran across an article 
Somebody shared it with me uh, about a woman who, who went into a Ben and Jerry's ice cream parlor in the Kansas City Plaza, and she was just trying to get an ice cream cone. And so it was her account. While she was ordering, she said another customer entered, and as she grabbed her ice cream cone, she turned around and found herself face-to-face with Brad Pitt, that beautiful man. <laughs> he, he was in town filming, right? And, and so she wrote in the article, this is what she said, quote, his blue eyes made my knees buckle. So she finished paying uh, really quickly, and then she ran out of the store, and her heart was still pounding. And after she regained her composure, she realized that she had forgotten her ice cream cone. So now she turned around to go back inside, and who does she meet as she's going back in who is coming out of the store? And it's Brad Pitt again, that beautiful man. And he spoke to her, and he said, Are you looking for your ice cream cone? This is my addition. Unable to utter a word to him, she, just, she said she just simply nodded. Yes. And then Brad Pitt said, you put it in your purse with your change. <laughs> and that was her story. I mean, she was so starstruck, awestruck by Brad Pitt that she literally put her ice cream cone in her purse as she left the store. This is what happens when you and I get in the presence of great beauty. <laughs> we kind of lose ourselves a little bit, don't we? we, we, when, we when, when, when I'm around like a great, I'll just say this, when I've been around a great guitarist, I met Stevie Ray Vaughan one time and I've had recently had a renewal of my love and appreciation for, for Stevie Ray Vaughan as a blues guitarist. This kind of was going back through these memories. I met him one time and I can remember being awestruck, Right? When we, when we get around somebody who is, excels in an area, if you're a gymnast and you get around Simone Biles or somebody, you'd be like, oh. I mean, there's something. I can remember one time I, I met Stevie Wonder, and when I first, and I've been a big fan for many, many, many years, and when I first saw him, I, I, I thought, who is this? Who is this guy who's dressed in the dashiki with the braids and who's trying to look like Stevie Wonder? And then as he got closer to me, I was like, that's Stevie Wonder. And I am ashamed to say that I literally got woozy and lost my balance a little bit. Because <laughs> I'm like, I, should be, I shouldn't be like that, like a, you know, like a teenage girl swooning. But I was. It's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Whenever we're around great Greatness. Let me just say, whenever we're around greatness, it affects us in some way. It does this thing to us. It, it traumatizes us a little bit. Because on the one hand, we're drawn to that. But on the other hand, it exposes us. I mean, when I'm around a great guitarist, I'm like, oh, I want to be there, but I don't want to have to play right after he plays <laughs> or she plays. I don't want to do that because it's going to expose me for the amateur that I am. This is why it's traumatic to be in the presence of such greatness and beauty. Dorothy Sayers said of Jesus, he had a daily beauty that made us ugly. And we feel exposed. Actually, her next line, if I recall right, was, and so the, uh, and so the rulers of the day thought it better to rid themselves of him in the name of peace and quietness. <laughs> When we put ourselves next to God, we see how utterly inadequate we are. We're weak. We are not in control. We're not nearly as smart or as strong or as capable as we pretend to be. And so Joshua, his response when he realizes this is the living God, and somehow as he's perceiving this with the angel of the Lord, he falls down on his face, which is about the only thing that you can do when you really are in the presence of God. It happens all throughout Scripture people who are in the presence of God and who are traumatized by it. Remember when Peter has this interaction with Jesus and then Jesus finally comes, there's the, there's the great catch of fish after Jesus sends him back out to fish and Peter realizes this is not just some ordinary prophet and the Bible says that he falls down at the feet of Jesus and he says, depart from me, I'm a sinner. He says, I, 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 I can't believe it, I, I can't even be near you. Isaiah the prophet is uh, 
many of you might not know this, he was, by all accounts that we can understand from the scripture, he was a member of the royal family. So he wasn't just a, a he didn't just have an official role as a prophet in Israel. He also had a, had a, had a royal pedigree. He, he has it together, he pro- and it's part of the reason probably why his writing is so beautiful. He was an educated man. He was a person of status. He has this great pedigree, and he has a prophetic calling. But when he gets in the presence of God in Isaiah 6, listen to what he says. He says, I am a man undone. I am a man of unclean lips. Listen to what he says. And I'm a part of a people of unclean lips. Now, what does Isaiah key in on? He says, here's the two things that make me me. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a representative of the people of Israel. And I'm a man with a prophetic calling. His lips are his trade, if you will. And he says, you know what? Now that I'm in the presence of God, I realize my pedigree means nothing. My people are broken. And my lips, they're unclean, just like everybody else's. He says, everything that I thought was so great, now that I'm in the presence of God, I realize his perfection is, is, is what I need to be turning my attention to. Not, not, not the, the headline isn't how great is Isaiah. The headline is how great is our God. Annie Dillard An essayist, she said it like this, we come at God with an unwarranted air of professionalism, with authority and pomp as though we know what we're doing and as though people in themselves are an appropriate set of creatures to have dealings with God. This is what she says. Does anyone have the foggiest idea of what sort of power we so blithely invoke? Or, as I suspect, does no one believe a word of it? Churches are like children playing on the floor with their chemistry sets, mixing up a batch of TNT to kill a Sunday morning. It's madness to wear hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews, for the sleeping God may wake someday and take offense, or the waking God may draw us out to where we can never return. The holiness of God. It's the way God introduces himself to us, but it's the good news today. It means that he is perfect, complete, lacking nothing. Listen, nothing needs to be added to God to make him more God. Think about that. I'm, all the t- I'm a person in process, so are you. I'm all the time thinking, well, here's what I need. To-. There is nothing that makes God more complete today than he was yesterday or than he ever could be. There's nothing that could be taken away from him to make him more purely God, as if somehow he's been diluted in some way. Like, oh, you know what? He would be great, but if we could just, just get this habit gone or, or just this way of being. Who, listen, every one of us has good days and bad days, but God does not have a good day or a bad day. I'm all over the map. Sometimes Jesse might wake up and be like, which Steve am I going to get today? Listen, here's what you know about God. He is utterly holy. He is complete and perfect in every way. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, the writer of Hebrews said about Jesus, and you can know he's going to have a good day today. It's the good news. He doesn't take a day off from being God. He won't ever contradict his own nature. Every day he's loving, merciful, just, forgiving, and strong. He's not limited by anything except himself. He will always be himself. Listen to this. God is love. It's not just something that he does. It's not just something that he's come to enjoy or do well. He is love. He, and because he's love, he doesn't love you based on the variables of your day-to-day life. He loves you based on the invariable, inviolable nature of his character. That God is the Holy One is not some kind of detached, untouchable, sterile perfection. It's not holier than thou. It's not like the display desserts at a restaurant when they bring out that tray and you go, oh, that's not real. (laughs) It looks good, but you can't touch it, can't taste it. This is not the holiness of God. The holiness of God, the Bible says, is, is inviting us to draw near, inviting us to recognize who he is and to taste and see that the Lord is good. So first of all, that was the longest point. So just relax, okay? Second thing is God's holiness isn't just the good news, it's the goal. The goal for you and me. Joshua falls on his face and the angel says, take off your shoes. 
Joshua, you have a right response right now, and it's to take off your shoes. And you might ask, what's wrong with shoes? Because you would think that most of us are covering up our feet for a reason. Because I've seen some of your toes. It's not pretty. Some of you guys are like, you, got, you know it. You're like, hey, summertime, I keep these things covered. <laughs> Joshua, Joshua is told, take off your shoes. And so you, why, why does God's holiness relate to something like that? Why, 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 is, why does the angel care whether he's wearing shoes or not? What's wrong with shoes? And now I, I'll just, just take a step back as a way of explanation and say some of you guys began a Bible reading plan in January of the year. I see it happen every year. You start your Bible reading plan, and then you are defeated in Leviticus. You're like, I'm out. <laughs> Maybe next year, you know, we'll get done next year, right? I know about it because Leviticus, the book of Leviticus is filled with these laws and regulations for Israel, civil rules, religious rules, and, and, and there's all kinds of talk about stuff that we feel like doesn't relate to us at all. And, you know, we've got, we got the holy bowls over here and the holy candles right there and the, the holy pots over there. And so we, 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 we look at that and we're like, what is that? Why, why are they calling that holy? And what does it have to do with anything at all? Let me give you the right definition here for you and I to understand what holiness is. I talk about, uh, let's talk about God's holiness as undiluted perfection. But let's talk about our holiness today and talk about undivided devotion. Because the thing that may, how can a bowl be holy? The thing in Leviticus that made a bowl holy or any other utensil in, in, the, uh, in, in the temple or in the tabernacle was that this, this utensil is holy because it is devoted to the service of God only. That's what made it holy. It was devoted. This bowl was to be used for nothing else, right? This, 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 is, not used, this is not to be used for anything else other than in service of God. You see, in Leviticus, the opposite of holy, watch this, the opposite of holy is common. It wasn't unholy or sinful. It was common. So it was either devoted to God or it was common, <laughs> and it meant that that thing was devoted, that thing that was devoted only to the purposes of serving God. This is why the Pharisees, as moral as they were in Jesus' day, were not holy. Because Jesus outs them. He calls them out on it. He says, you all follow the law to the strictest letter. You've imposed all these rules. You're morally perfect, he says, but you are not holy. Because you're doing it not in service to God. You're doing it to get honor from the people. You're doing it to get to control of God or to feel superior to others. Jesus says, you can take all your morality and you can flush it down the drain because it means nothing to God. It's not holiness. Now, Joshua says this to the angel of the Lord. He says, are you going to help us take the city? Are you for us or are you for them? And the angel says, no. You're asking the wrong question. Are, are you on board with our cause? Wrong question. Are, are you going to help me have a better life, God? Wrong question. I, I'll, I'll serve you if you're going to help my people out, my family out, my agenda out. Nope. Wrong question. That's not the holy God, and that's not holiness. <laughs> even, even just like we said about the Pharisees, if I just do this, if I do this, will you, is the wrong approach to God. I'll serve you if you give me that job. I'll give to church if you get me a spouse. <laughs> I'll serve you if you agree with my lifestyle. I'll, I'll, if you support my plans and my agenda. No, what the Bible is saying is all of these things are common. They are rivals to God. All of these agendas that we have are rivals to God. What, what God has called us to in the scriptures when he says, be holy as I am holy, he has, the un, he has the undiluted perfection. You and I are supposed to have unrivaled devotion. The Bible would speak, it like, speak about it like this. It would call it a divided heart. Psalm 86.8 Here's where you see the flow. The psalmist says, there is none like you. That's what we're talking about. You are holy, God. And then right there, in a couple verses later, he says, so give me an undivided heart to fear your name. 
take out any of those rival, those rival devotions in my life. Holiness says that everything in my life is aligned with this purpose of serving God, right? It's not just my number. This is what some of us don't realize. Watch me here because this might be, this is going to be helpful. It's not just my number one commitment. It is the commitment from which all other commitments flow. Every other commitment in my life is rooted in my devotion to God. So it's not just, yeah, I'm going to put God first, and then I'm going to have family, and then I'm going to have what? Those are, that's a nice hierarchy of priorities, but you're missing the point. It's, this is the soil. It's my devotion to God. And from that soil comes up my devotion to my family, to my wife, to being a, a, a good employee, to, to, loving, to loving the church and serving the church. To, all that is all rooted in the soil of my devotion to God. It's what makes it all holy so that when I'm a good father, that's an act of holiness. Because it's rooted in my desire to honor God. When I'm a good husband, that's an act of holiness. Because it's coming up from the soil of my devotion to the Lord. How did the earliest Christians make a mark on their world? We ask, how did they do it? Oh, it's because they had these really funny preachers. And and powerful preachers visual presentations of the gospel, right? They created some amazing family programs that drew people in and were enter- both entertaining and practical. They had a great deal of political influence, right? And they pulled those levers and their economic influence as well to leverage, no! <laughs> some of you guys who know anything about history know they had none of that. Those earliest Christians had, they were ostracized. They were considered to be outcasts socially. They were persecuted. They were considered bigots and a danger to the social order. But somehow, people were attracted to them. There was a Christian named Methetes who wrote, this is about 50 years after the death of Jesus by, by all accounts, 50, 60 years maybe. And by now, this early community of, this, of Christians has, been, has begun to like turn the empire inside out. It's beginning to have this impact. And so Methodes is writing to his friend Diognetus, who isn't a believer. And his rationale behind, he says basically to him, he says, in so many words, he says, if you want to understand how there is such favor and such interest in this group of people who are Jesus followers. This is his line. Just listen to it. He says, really plainly, he says, we share our table with all, but not our bed with all. And in the Roman Empire, it was kind of the opposite. There was this sense of liberty, personal liberty. No husband was expected to be faithful to his wife. He would be permitted to sleep with another woman or another man, if that, would, if that should be, just, just, out of, just basically out of the liberty of, you know, and kind of the assumed sort of this is what happens. But no rich person would ever be expected to consort with the poor. They were considered to be cursed. And so you kind of have like this upside down thing. And here Methodes is saying, hey, we, we've turned that whole thing upside down because of what God has shown us. He says, we share our table with all. Anybody is welcome. There's this radical generosity and love. We're crossing racial boundaries. We're inviting people who are nothing like us or who, who, have, who we have a history of, of, of animosity with them. But they come and they share at our table. He says, but there's some other things we don't share. We don't share our bed with all. Fascinating look and a, and a fascinatingly succinct way of saying it. They were honest, merciful, chaste, generous. They were, let me just throw the word out there, holy. That was what turned the world upside down. And so we have as pastors this pressure in the world today and as church leaders and as church goers, we have this pressure. How do we make this thing appealing, right? How do we get this thing going? Can we get some family programs working here? We need them to be both practical and entertaining. And Steve, you're going to have to bring more jokes. Thanks so much for the few things that you do bring, but I need to see your joke quota go up by like five in every sermon, right? 
My neighbors don't want to come hear this stuff unless it's really going to make them laugh. I'm telling you, we feel this pressure, but what I'm getting at, what I'm driving at, is the goal for you and me is not all that other stuff. The goal is to be holy as he is holy. And if you and I are reflecting the perfection of God in our lives, if our lives and our lives' commitments are rooted in the soil of holiness and undivided devotion to him, then you will see how people will be drawn to that in the same way they will be drawn to the living God. So be holy. Leviticus 19.2, God says it. Be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. And so, point number three, if this is the goal, how do I get it? Well, number three is God's holiness is a gift. It's a gift. Joshua sees the man with the sword drawn. He realizes that this is the angel of the Lord, and he He thinks to himself, probably rightly so, I'm a goner. (laughs) The drawn sword, Joshua would have known. You and I can look at just, just that other instance of the sword of the Lord. The drawn sword, for those of you guys who are, uh, who are astute students of the Bible, you will know that when Adam and Eve sinned, that God passed judgment on them and said, In this broken state, you cannot inherit eternal life. It'll just be eternal misery. And and you're inflicting your brokenness on the rest of God's created order. And so he takes what was once that paradise, that place where there was unbroken fellowship and relationship between him and him and Adam and Eve, and he says, you can no longer stay here. You've got to leave Eden. And what does the Bible say that is placed there at, at at the entrance to the garden east of Eden? It's a flaming sword. It's basically, this is the cost of sin. The sword is the cost of sin. And so this drawn sword there, when, when Joshua sees it, they, they, he, he, there, there has to be this sense that, of connection here that, as we read the text that we're seeing. These people have been cast out because the wages of sin is death and the sword of the Lord is against sinners. We instinctively know that. That's why when I think the right response, I don't know, I can tell you that every time that I've ever seen the presence of God in power in a place, the response from people is not always, oh, this is so great. The response is, I need to find a rock to hide underneath. Because like Isaiah, I'm a man undone. And I know that the sword of the Lord is against sinners. But God's holiness, it seems to be like this, how how will we ever attain, how will we ever reach it? How could we ever touch it as sinful people? And the answer is you cannot on your own. That's why sometimes I think when we talk about God's holiness or I say a word, I I repeat a verse that says, be holy as I am holy. And people in church are like, "Mm." I think I tried that once. It didn't work. It didn't take. You know why? Because there's nothing in us. There's nothing in you and there's nothing in me. There's no resource that I have to be holy as God is holy. It is simply something that has to be received, a gift from God. So watch this. Jesus, all throughout the Gospels, is saying, you know that, you know that angel of the Lord who appeared to Moses in the bush and said, I am? Jesus says in John 8, I am. That, that same I am. <laughs> it sounds Dr. Seussish, but it's not. It's in the, I am. I am that I, he said, I, I'm, I'm that guy. I was there at the bush. I was there. I stood there with the sword drawn in front of Joshua. I was there with the three Hebrew boys in the fire. I was there. I am that I am. I was there when Moses first told you to take off your shoes because God is holy. And on the night of his betrayal, Jesus is praying for his disciples who he knows they don't have what it takes to be holy. And he says this. He's about to die, but he's praying for them. And in John 17, he says, for their sake, Father, I sanctify myself. What? 
Wasn't he already perfect enough? What does he mean when he says, I sanctify myself? It gets back to that idea of devoted. He's saying, I am devoting myself. I am going to commit myself to you and your purposes. For their sake, Father, I am sanctified to be the guy who lays down his life for them in service to God. I sanctify myself that they might be devoted to you as well. It's a gift we receive because of what Jesus... Jesus says, I make myself holy. That's literally what he's saying. For their sake, Lord, I make myself holy. And you say, wasn't Jesus already moral? Yes, he was. But what he's saying is, I am set apart for this one thing. And with his face like a flint, Jesus goes down that path to offer himself as a sacrifice for our sins to take the punishment that you and I deserve, and in one sense, to take the sword that you and I deserve. For their sake, Jesus is saying, I'll take the sword that's really theirs, and I'll bear the weight of it. I'll, I'll take that sword. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus took the judgment that our sin deserved, and now this is the great news. Now, when you and I figure this out, we say, now the sword of the Lord is not against us, it's for us. And that's what you want. <laughs> the God who I was... There was this great chasm between me and him has now made, built a bridge that looks cross-shaped so that you and I can actually come to him. And instead of the sword being against us, now the Apostle Paul rejoices and says, no, 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 just so you know, this God is for us, not against us. And that's the only reason why. 1 Peter 1 says his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he's given us his great and precious promises so that you might participate in the divine nature. What is Peter saying? He's saying, now, because of Jesus, you can become, part you can become participants. You can be holy as God is holy. You can be undivided in your love for him. You can be healed of your sin. The sword of the Lord that was against you is now for you. Paul says it like this. So, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he finds acceptable. This is your reasonable act of worship, it would say in the Greek. Don't copy the behavior or the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing how you think. Then you'll learn what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Hey, guys. I'm telling you, the holiness of God is the good news today. <laughs> Do not brush past that. It's the number one thing that God wants you to know about. And not only that, it's the goal for you and I that we would be holy as he is holy. And we cannot get there without the help and the gift of God that comes to us by the grace of God through Jesus and the help of the Holy Spirit today, working in you, like Paul said, to will and to do, to want to and to follow through on his good purposes for your life. Can't happen without him. But my prayer, my passion is this, that you and I as God's people would be stirred in our hearts again to say, Lord, you are holy. There is no one else like you. God, we've tried to make you common. We've tried to make you just like us. we try tried to put all these things in place. But God, we actually have to admit today you are holy. And you have called us to be holy. So Lord, our hearts are broken because of our sin. But because of Jesus, we can rejoice and receive your forgiveness today. Please make us holy, oh God. There will be nothing else that will transform this culture but a people of God who are holy, who are undivided in their devotion to the undiluted perfection who is God. There is no other way. But by God's grace today, you, you and I can receive that holiness. As Kim sang today, I'm going to just throw a curveball because we are, we're going to get out of here in one second. But as Kim sang today, and I'm going to invite the whole team to come up here because we're going to go straight into this. I, I was so struck by this idea when we were singing that song, Freedom. There is a lie in our culture that says freedom is liberty to do what you want. 
I thought, you know what? If there is a battleground around the word, it's freedom. Because I think it's confusing when we stand up and we say, freedom, freedom. You know, we sing that song. People are like, oh, this is great. I can do what I want. That's the lie. The devil is a liar. <laughs> because in the reality of this, of this created order that we live in, some of those things that you say, oh, I can do what I want, you've experienced it. The old people in the room know this. You live however you want. You let your desires be, the dri be in the driver's seat of your life, and you end up in chains. Every addict would, didn't start out saying, oh, I, I would love to be an addict. They said, I want to do what I want to do. I, I'll tell you that everybody who's addicted to porn didn't start out saying, oh, I would love to be really, you know, just I'd love to ruin every relationship that I've got and just mess up my head so that I can't really understand intimacy. Nobody ever said that. They said, I just want to do what I want. And our culture, lie, there is a lie in our culture. They say, freedom means doing whatever you want. Let me just redefine it for you. Freedom is the power to be holy. Freedom is the strength to grow up in the soil of that holiness of God and to say, now I'm the person God designed me to be in all of the beauty that reflects the beauty of God. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me. Because I think there are some people in here today, and I, I just, I know it's like kind of, it's almost like rousing some people from a deep sleep. There are some of you today who have let go of this idea, but you know in your heart of hearts that God is calling you to be holy, and it hasn't been your life. And I'm telling you today, this is the moment to commit to it. But before we get there, I'm going to say if there would be some person today who would say simply, I need to be forgiven of sin. I need my relationship with my Heavenly Father to be restored. And I need you to pray. I want you to pray with me, Steve. If that's you, before we go, we're going to pray together. I want you to raise your hand and say, that's me. I need to be right. Thank you. Is there anybody else? You just raise your hand and say, I, just pray with me. One, two, three, four, five, six. You can put your hands down. Is there anybody else? Seven. Praise God. Eight, nine, thank you. I want you to pray with me. We're going to pray this prayer. It's just a simple confession of faith in Jesus. It's simply saying, Lord, I can't do it on my own, but because of what Jesus did, because Jesus took the sword, I can be free. I can be made right. So say this with me. Say, dear Lord Jesus. Come on, say it again. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe that on the cross you took my sin, my shame, my guilt, and you died for it. You faced the sword for me so I wouldn't have to. But you rose again to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. So today, Lord Jesus, I turn away from my sin to be holy. Jesus is my Savior. God is my Father. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. Can we praise the Lord today?